everybody all right that's a level two let me get to a level seven good evening everybody oh amen look at your lady and say I'm glad you're here tonight turn to the other side and say now give me two dollars <laughs> that's when you know they were a real friend or not there you go we're so honored to be here with you tonight my name is Steve Yates and I'm the pastor of Frontier Church and we're so honored to be here our church family came with me to show support and I want to honor uh, my wife Chanita would you please stand she's my rib glad she came out and I love ribs and uh, we're so happy to have many of our leaders that came here Frontier would you show uh, um, uh, Revolution Church how much we love them would you stand and give them a standing ovation we love you. We love your pastor. Amen. We're so glad to uh, be with you tonight. This is be my first uh, Saturday night service here at Revolution Church, and I'm excited. Uh, you have an amazing pastor. Uh, pastor Moses Robbins is a man that I just honor, and uh, let's give a hand for your pastor, who's an amazing man of God. <clears throat> amazing. I met him years ago in uh, Home Depot, and I said, if anybody's bold enough to put up on the billboard, scumbags welcome. I said, I gotta meet him, I don't care who he is. So I tracked him down at Home Depot, and I said, man, I got to get to know you, and uh, we've been friends ever since. And uh, so I'm glad to be here tonight. Tonight, I just wanna jump into the uh, Word of God, and I wanna share a word uh, with you that the Lord has given our church. And uh, I ministered this message just last week uh, in our pulpit, but I'd like to share it with you because I think it's, it, it's, it's applicable to all of God's churches here in America and especially here in Lake County with what God's doing. And part of the answer to the issues in church is unity. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, it's all about unity. Let me tell you now, if you didn't know before, I'm going to tell you now that it is all about the big unity. It is all about being on the same page, moving in the same direction, walking with the same step. Jesus said there's one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. Can I get an amen from somebody? 
There is only oneness in the Lord. Jesus says, I do what I do because my Father and I are one. There is unity in God's Spirit. He says, listen, I can't wait to the day that I break the heavens and I get to my throne. And the Bible says, as me and my Father are one, you and I will be one as well. Unity is inbred like thread into the knit of the body of Christ. It is, it is the life bread of any living, breathing organization. I don't know anybody that can survive with the heart outside the body. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know anybody that can run a marathon with one foot. Hello, somebody. Well, unless they put that thing on. Well, anyway, that's another story. So, so unity is very important. It's a lesson that I learned years ago, and I learned it from a man by the name of Coach Mueller. Anybody ever play sports in here? Anybody ever play sports? Okay, let me hear all my football guys. That's kind of weak. That's kind of weak. Let me hear all my soccer guys. <laughs> We're going to stop right there. <laughs> yeah, he's unified for real by himself. Anyway. So sports was a big thing for me, but I grew up in a, in a, in a uh, high school that was named Withrow High School. Withrow High School had a unique reputation. It was the worst inner city high school uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was terrible. I mean, if you went to the, if, if you talk about uh, uh, bringing lunch money, dude, they robbed the robbers who took your lunch money. It was bad. And so when I went to school, you knew that it was a fight going to school, a fight going to back to school. And, and, and coming back from school, and I played on the football team. Now, 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 with the high school football team had a record. And the record was that they always lost. In 15 years, they had never won a season. In 15 years, they were the worst team in the city. And, and, and so when you join the team, some of these guys that you join with, you would see them in the street. You want to fight them. And so when you came to the field, you want to fight them. He said, hi, can you hit the guy next to you? That was, that was kind of how we lived. And then Coach Mueller came into the picture. Coach Mueller was a guy that was probably about, I don't know, 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five with stack heels on a good day. Short man, about this tall. Coach Mueller's mustache is probably bigger than he was. But Coach Mueller would stand there and he said, he came in with the mindset that, listen, I'm going to find the one thing that is common between all of you. And he says, I believe with all my heart the one thing that is common between every single person in this, on this field is that you want to win. Now, you may not like each other, but you want to win. And Coach Mueller realized that in order to cause this team to be unified, he had to signalize, they had to circle around the one thing they had in common, and that is the desire to win. And I believe in this church, is there anybody that wants to win in life? Anybody in the building? Anybody want to be, anyone would agree that you don't want to lose anymore. You, want to, you don't want to have another year that makes you sad, another day where you're, where you're upset, another day that someone dies needlessly. You want to be, you want to win in your life. And here's the reality. Not only did he know that he wanted all of us to win, but he found out that we were different. Every single person in this room was born different. You are unique in your own way. And he realized that if I can just catalyze what is both one thing is common is that they are unified, but if I can just, if I can just bring together in this gumbo soup of a team that they are also different. There are runners and, and people can catch the ball. Strong men, weak men, smart men, fast men. If I can bring everybody's gifts in talents together then I know we can win and what was interesting is that, that year I played can you believe it I was the lineman on the first uh, st uh, first season I played I played uh, a pulling guard and 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 that year we've never won ever before but that year Withrow high school football team went undefeated somebody say amen Somehow, some way, that coach was able to unify these kids who would fight each other in the street, pull them together, and say, "Listen, you're one team. You're all on the. You all got one goal, and that is to win." And that year, not only did we go undefeated, but we took it all the way to the playoffs. Why? Because we were unified. And here's the thing the pastor understood, that the team had something to offer him and the pastor had something to offer the team. And when they realized that together they're better, then they were able to become undefeated. Now, is there any difference between a football team and the local church? And I like to say it like this, pastors are like coaches. 
Pastors must understand what is common between all of the people. And then he must understand the gifts and the talents and the things that are different about them and then pull them together as a unified team. And when a pastor and his church unify, then they can be a church that becomes undefeated, a church that can take back what the enemy has stolen. Anybody remember that song back in the day? I'm going to run into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from me. Anybody ever heard that before? Must be in my neighborhood. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody and say, I want to win. See, when I say pastors are like coaches, it is true. Because when you begin to look at the, the, the Greek word for a pastor, it is the word poimain, poimain. And it's, and it's a unique word because it means this, a shepherd or a herdsman. A shepherd or a herdsman. That means somebody whose role it is to make sure that the sheep get to where there's greener grass. Somebody say Amen. And so the reality is, is that there are certain responsibilities that a pastor has, just like a coach has. And I think it's a symbiotic relationship between the pastor and the church and the church and the pastor. And here's the role of the pastor. His job is to identify when the enemy is coming in. The role of the pastor is to watch and make sure that everything's right. When the enemy breaks in, he's looking out for him. In other words, he's got to be the standard bearer for truth. He's got to have the word, stand on the word, and when something's wrong, he's got to be able to speak the truth in love and kindness. But not only that, here's another truth about a pastor. A pastor's job to a church is very simple. Not only must he identify the dangers of a pastor or a group of sheep, but he also must be willing to fight when the wolves come in. Somebody say amen. amen. In other words, he must be able to lay his life down. Does anybody know anybody that had to lay their life down for you? Does anybody, can you just testify for a minute? Did anybody put their hands on the left on a piece of wood and put their right hand on a piece of wood and let two nails go through their feet? Did anybody lay their life down for anybody up in here? That is why he's called the good shepherd. Because a good shepherd is willing to die for his people. And a pastor has a symbiotic relationship. He must be willing to die for the life of the sheep in his church. And I believe that's very true about the kind of pastor you have. I believe not only is he willing to lay his life down, but he has to defend from attackers. And not only that, but he has to heal the wounded sheep. Sometimes we go through life and we suffer from injury because it, not even, it may not even be caused by us. Maybe by, because somebody did something to us and we're wounded. And it is the role of the pastor to heal that sheep. And when they're healing, healed again, put them back on the path again. But not only that, to heal the sheep, but to save the lost or trapped sheep. Now, now here's the thing about sheep. Sometimes they get trapped on purpose. Somebody say amen. <laughs> What that means is this, sometimes, uh, and I don't know about you, but when, 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 when I've ever done wrong, there were times I didn't, the devil didn't make me do it. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil didn't make me do it. I did it, amen. I went where I went, I did what I did, I did it all on my own, and I got trapped. And sometimes a shepherd's role isn't to run to everybody's rescue. Let me, let me break it down for you. Uh, I had a professor who was a Bedouin, went to uh, Israel and stayed among the Bedouin tribes. And one of the things he noticed, he went out with some shepherders and he went out on the field and he saw the sheep that had gone astray and it went off the cliff down to a lower part of the cliff because the, the sheep thought there was nice green grass on the lower level. And so the sheep jumped down and he just stood there and you could hear the bleeding of the sheep. And what do you think a good pastor would do? How many think he would go get that sheep? Come on, let me see your hand. How many believe he would go get that sheep? How many believe he will not go get that sheep? How many don't know? Come on, let me see those who just be honest with me. Amen. Well, let me tell you what he did. He sat there, and the guy was looking at him and said, aren't you going to go get the sheep? He goes, no. And he walks off. And a little bit while later, he can still hear the sheep bleeding. He says, oh, aren't you going to get your sheep? No. A little while later, he could still hear the sheep. He said, listen, dude, I appreciate what you guys are doing out here, but I'm totally confused. 
I thought your job was to protect the sheep. I thought your job was to save the sheep. He says, I am saving the sheep. He says, but he's still on the cliff. He says, you don't understand sheep. He says, when that sheep went down, it was very strong. And it went down there because it wanted green grass. But, but, but because if I try to go get him right now, he's going to, because he's so strong, when I go to reach for him to pull him back up, he's going to jump off the cliff. So I have to wait till he's eaten all the grass, gets weak, and then like a good shepherd, I scoop him down and pull him back up. Isn't it good to have a pastor that doesn't tell you what to do, but is there for you when you need him? Somebody say amen. That's a good pastor. The, a pastor's job is to earn the trust of the sheep, and that's what happens in the latter days. But, but like the, the symbiotic relationship of what a role of a pastor is to do, it must be reciprocated back to the pastor. And here's something I taught. Now, now let me be very clear with you. This is what we taught at my church last week. Somebody say amen. amen. We taught this last week because we were going through a series called 411, the fivefold ministry. I'm going to tell you about the role of the pastor in the local church. This isn't about uh, Frontier. This isn't about Revolution Church. This is about God's church. And so we began to teach these lessons about the role of a pastor in a congregation. But like the role of the, co of the, the pastor to the church, there's a role of the church to the pastor. Let me explain what that is. Like the flock of sheep, a church will commit to the care and direction of the leaders they were given. They will commit to the care and direction of the leaders they were given. Could you imagine a shepherd where the sheep never follow him? Does he have a flock? No. See, the whole idea is that God, someone is telling that pastor, I need to take you someplace where you can grow. And so the sheep follow, but they must commit to the leadership and the care of the local pastor because it is a gift from God. And so there's a symbiotic relationship. One gives this way and the other gives back this way. He protects and lays his life down. And on the flip side, they commit to his leadership and direction. And in that, they become what? Unified. And when you are unified, you can win. Now watch this. How will I know if I got a good pastor I can follow? How will I know if I've got a good pastor I can commit? I mean, I want to know because, you know, sometimes life comes and people say things and things happen. And, and I begin to wonder, am I around a good leader that can, that can help me get to where my heart beats for, where, 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 where my, my dreams keep pointing me to? How do I know that, 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 that I've got a good pastor? And the Bible says that God laid down a, 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 a parameter for what that looks like. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. What does a good pastor look like? Jeremiah chapter 3, 15. Would you read it, please? Read. Okay, let me stop. Now that we're all on the same screen, let's read now. Stop. According to whose heart? Who's my heart? God's heart. There will be times that what you hear come out of your pastor's mouth doesn't sound like what we may want to hear, but it's actually coming from what? The heart of God. There will be times in ministry where things don't make sense. But because your pastor said it, I believe it. Let me give you a good example. Jesus said to the disciples, he says, I want you to get in the boat and I want you to go to the other side. The disciple says, okay, we're going to do what you say, but it looks like a storm's brewing. But we're going to get in the boat. But you know, I'm not so sure about this thing. Kind of, not, kind of nervous, kind of awkward, and they get in the boat, and sure enough, halfway across the water, three o'clock in the morning, a storm arises, and they're struggling and toiling for their life. But the Bible says that Jesus was in the midst of prayer with the Father, and he looks up. Now, what would make Jesus look up from an intimate time with his Father? Because his sheep were in danger. 
And the Bible says that he came down from the mountain and he could have come to the water's edge. But he said, you know what? If it takes a miracle to get my sheep out of trouble, then I'm looking for a miracle. And he stepped on the water and he began to walk on the water and he came all the way out to where the disciples were. And they were like, it's got to be a ghost. It's, there's no way our pastor can lead us like this. It's got to be a ghost. But how many know God is real? Hello, somebody. And the Bible says that he stepped into the boat and said it'll all be all right. And in an instant, they were on the shore. Why? Because his instructions were right on the first time. You cannot be worried about your storm. Listen to the direction. If he said it, God said it, it's going to come to pass. Just believe. You know, most Christians don't experience the miracles because they have a trouble believing in what they cannot see. But faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by what? The word of God. Faith that is seen is not faith. You can't, you can't say, I see it, therefore I believe it. You must believe it, therefore I see it. Psalms 27 says, I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You must believe. And is it a strange thing for God to give you a vision that's bigger than you? I want you to stop for a second, everyone in the room, and I want to ask yourself a question. If I gave you a check from God that will not bounce, amen, and you could do anything you wanted for God, and you could do it and know that it would not fail, in this instant tonight, I want you to ask yourself, what would you do for God? Think about it. Is it too big for you? If it's not too big for you, it's probably not big enough. God will always stretch us to where he wants to take us. Because sheep sometimes don't want to go on their own. And as a pastor, God speaks to his heart and says, here's where I'm going. Will you follow I want to show you what the word says. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to walk the word here for a second. And I want you to see how God begins to illustrate what the, the definition of the role of the church and the reason a pastor is birthed into the earth. And, 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 and it's very important that we understand these are gifts given to men. And I'll explain here in a minute. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Let's all read together. Go. So Jesus ascended into heaven and he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now the word gifts here is charisma. It is, it is, it, it, it is the power and, and, and God gave a gift to humankind. And he's about to illustrate what those gifts are. Let me go ahead and let you in on a clue. The gifts are people. They are people who are designed to do what they're called to do. They're designed to think like God, have God's heart. They're the, they're the Jeremiah pastors that come into the world that all of their life, all of their story has been a struggle. It's been a hurt or pain or a habit or a hang up. How many had hurt or habits or hang ups in here? Anybody ever had one of those? Well, see, God uses every bruise you have on your body so that he can take you, that you can heal somebody else. See, your life is not an accident. It's on purpose. <laughs> on purpose. Not one of you is, is an accident in the earth. God saw you. He said to Jeremiah, before you were in your mama's belly, I knew you. I understood what you would be like. I understood how you would talk. I understood where you would show up. I created you to do something amazing in this earth. Now listen to me. If you're wondering what your purpose is, that means you've got to get close to your pastor because that's what his heart is designed to do, to help you reach your full potential in God. But this man is a, a pastor is designed in heaven like a cookie is designed by a baker. He's, he's made with all the ingredients to lead the local body of believers. Let's look and see what the Lord has to say about that. Look at verse 11 and let's look at what he gave us. Let's all read it out loud. Go. He gave some apostles and some prophets, 
some evangelists, and the word here is pastor and teachers. In the Greek, that means one word. It is a pastor who teaches. That's how you know you got a good pastor, because if you got a pastor who cannot teach, he's not a pastor. If you got a teacher who cannot pastor, he's not a pastor either. You've got to have both. A God-given pastor is a pastor who wants to teach you the Word of God. And so in the Word, the Bible says that he ascended and gave these gifts, men who are called to be pastors. And let me show you how and why he gave them. This is for you. This is for the church. Let's read verse 12. Let's read together. Go. Watch this. Three reasons God gives men, uh, uh, pastors, as gifts to the local church. Not for you to pump them up, not to brag on them, not to have Mercedes and, and to have nice homes. All those are well and great if you have them, but that's not why a pastor's here. A pastor is in your church for a particular reason. I want to show you the very first reason. Take a look at this. For the perfecting of the saints. How many is a saint in here? Okay, let me show you something I do in my church. This is hobbit hands. This is human hands. Hobbit, human. All right? I'd like to see human hands. All right, let me ask the question again. How many people in this church are saints? How many believe you're not a saint? How many are just confused why you're even in church tonight? No, you better put your hand. That's my boy. Boy, you better put your hand down. Don't start none, won't be none. Mama, you need to go sit over there. They ain't getting out of hand. Okay. Watch this. Let me, let me instruct because you need to know this. How many, I don't know how many of you grew up Catholic. Anybody grew up Catholic in here? I grew up Catholic as well. I was an altar boy. I had to pour the water on the priest's hand. I made the fresh bread, broke it. You know, I had the white little gown on. Don't, don't talk about me. It was a holy gown. It wasn't... Anyway, so I would wear this white thing. I was, a, I was there in the Catholic faith, and they said that the saints were people like Mother Teresa and, and, and St. Patrick and, and, and St. Saint, 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 all these people. But that's not what the Word of God says. If you were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are born again. All things passed away. Behold, all things become new. You are a saint of the living God. Come on and give God a hand. You don't have to do nothing, earn nothing. You just got to accept the gift. You're a saint. You're a saint. Quit beating down on yourself. You know the number one problem that most people have isn't what other people say to you, but what you say to yourself. Your self-talk will determine whether you believe what God is telling you. And if you're telling you you're nothing, you're, I ain't never going to be. How many have ever done this? You lock your keys in your car and you go, oh, I'm so stupid. Anybody ever done that besides my wife? Anybody? <laughs> I'm going, that's going to cost me a meal. I know it. Watch this. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that Jesus had was that I am my father's. I'm a son of the king. Are you the son of God? Yep. Are you a daughter of God? Yep. Your attitude determines your altitude on every level. What the word says should determine how you think about yourself. Watch this. Here's what he says. For the perfecting of the saints. I want you to focus on that word perfecting for a minute. And I want you to turn to, I want to give you what that means in the Greek. It's a unique word. What does it mean to perfect the saint? Listen, the church is all about restoration. And it's all about restoring you back to your original purpose and design. Life messes us up but do you not understand that you were designed to do something before you hit the world and though the world may mess up how things think how you think about things sometimes god is trying to mend your nets so you can get back to where you're supposed to be i want you to turn to matthew chapter 4 verse 21 Matthew 4 and 21, and, and this is the same word perfecting as is used in perfecting the saints that is used here in Matthew 4 and 21. 
And I want you to see what perfecting really does. When you have it, say amen. All right, we got three people who have it. Amen. When you have it, say amen again. There we go. Let's read. Is it up on the screen? We the people. No, that's not it. That's, that's not it. I'll read it for you. Here we go. Matthew 4 and 21. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, John, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father. Watch this. Mending their nets. That word, mending their nets, is the same word, perfecting. It means that through use, through life, through what you've gone through, through what you've been told, through your hurts, your hang-ups, and your, your habits, it's, it's called rips in your nets. And the work of a pastor is to restore you back to your original purpose. To mend the holes. You know, how many in here are tired of holes in your nets? Anybody just tired of every time you turn around, something goes wrong, something happens? And th those are holes in the net. And the role of a pastor it, within the local church is to mend and to bring you, restore you back to your original purpose. That is one of the roles of the fourfold ministry. Number two, let's take a look at something else. What is the second one? The role of a pastor is restoration of purpose. For what reason? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and 12 and read it again. Ephesians 4 and 12. You there? We the people. Me the pastor. <laughs> you the scripture somewhere. All right, do I have to read it? Do I have to read it on my own? Okay, here we go. Matthew 4 and 12. For the perfecting of the saints... Watch this, for the work of ministry. Why would God be interested in sending you pastors that, that the whole goal is that you be restored? Why would he give you a pastor whose heart will be day in and day out among the sheep, loving them, caring for them, fighting for them? Why would he give you a, a pastor like Moses Robbins? Why would he give my church a pastor like Steve Yates? Why would he give you a pastor after his heart? Why? Watch this. For the work of ministry. The word ministry means diakonos. This is where we get our word deacons. It means to serve. The reason that God brings restoration back into your life is so that you can serve the church. I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the church universal. I want you to ask the question, what is your gift? What is your talent? What is it that God gave you? What is it that you had? Like I was listening to you worship. I know that's your gift, girl. You were singing up. You were, we, we said you were singing. You weren't singing. You were singing. She was singing in her gifting. Now I want to ask you, are you using what God gave you? You say yes? What's your gift? You feed the masses. Can you do more than that? Okay. May I suggest to you that you have more potential than just feeding people. I guarantee you without a shadow of a doubt that the gift of God that's in you is bigger than what you perceive at this point. I guarantee it. Guarantee. I believe that even in your life, you have the ability to write and to put down God's word in a wonderful way. I believe in your life, you have the ability to lead other ladies if you would so choose. I believe in your life that you could set up a whole mission for other young ladies to grow up into ministry and be able to develop themselves under tutelage and mentorship. I believe it's bigger than what you think. Amen. How many know that the work of ministry is designed that you may serve somebody else? Now my question today is, is, is are you serving and how can you serve more why would God bring the spirit of restoration so that you can serve back to the church? Because here's the thing, guys. When people stop fellowshipping, can I get serious for a minute? When we stop fellowshipping in the congregation and in the fellowship, there is disunity. And the only way a team could win is with what? Unity. 
I want to show you something here. The greatest role of a pastor we're about to read in verse 13. Can we pull verse 13 on the screen? Let's read. Stop. Till some of us come. The, the ones who got money, till they come. The ones that are only the talented, till they come. No, the Bible says till we all come to the unity. Listen, let me tell you something. That nobody is to be neglected. You may not be sitting in the front, but that means that God gave you a gift somewhere else. You've got to serve and you've got to serve well because we all must come into the what? Unity of the faith. God's ultimate goal is that we all be unified by our faith. And watch this. Read. And of? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, the idea of unity is to bring... Let me tell you what unity means. You might want to write this down. Unity is the state of being undivided. It is the state of being undivided. It means oneness. You're going to love this word. It is the condition of harmony. When a church is in unity, they make music together. Somebody say amen. amen. It is the condition of harmony. Now, now, now the opposite of harmony is discord. And that is what the Lord is trying to avoid in the local church. It, it is the ultimate role to bring unity for a reason. And I think the greatest shepherd of all has given us an understanding of why there must be unity because the great shepherd is trying to lead us. And it gives us insight into what our under shepherds are supposed to do. I'd like for you to go to the most famous psalm in the world. Who can tell me what it is? What is it? 23rd Psalm. I want you to turn to the 23rd Psalm. I just want to read two verses and it 23rd Psalm and, it, and it's two verses two verses that we're going to focus on and this gives you insight to the role of a pastor watch this Psalms 23 and 1 everyone read stop read it again Read it again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. For God to say that I'm your shepherd and you shall not want must mean he knows the things you have need of before you what? Ask. A good shepherd understands your needs, but a good shepherd doesn't always give you what you want. He doesn't always give you what you ask for because it may not be what you need. But the Lord, when it's time to get what you want, you cannot miss it. The Lord is my shepherd, and I what? Shall not. Verse 2. Read. Watch this. He layeth me down in green pastures. The role of a good pastor is to take you someplace where you're growing where you can grow. That means you're feeding on good food. That, that means it may not be here. It may be someplace else. God may have a vision that's bigger than what you know, but he's taking you someplace so you can grow and not be kept in a box. The idea of a good shepherd is to take you to a place you can grow. And here's the other reason why. Look at this. He maketh me to not lie down in green pastures. And he leadeth me beside what? Still waters are places of safety. That means if you are sheep and you get into mud, running water, you can drown. So his goal is to lead you where you can grow and not where you would drown. Sometimes people jump out too soon and they get overwhelmed too fast. And so a pastor may say, I need to lead, lay you down by the green. In other words, I need you to just lay down right now. I don't need you to go doing anything. I just need you to learn. I need you to grow. I need you to develop. Because, listen, your future is not going to leave you. I just need you to lay down in green pastures and eat what I give you. Eat the growth that God has given you, and then I can send you on your way. You don't always rush into the waters. A good pastor knows that a sheep jumped in the water can be swallowed up by the waters. 
So a good pastor will have to say no sometimes just for your safety. But here's the question. Why are these gifts given? The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor who teaches is given for the perfecting of the saints, the unifying of the body of Christ. And watch this. I love this part. To do what? To do what? To keep us safe from what? Go to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. This is all in the same verse. What do we need to be kept safe from? All right, I'm going to read it then. I want you to write down your Bibles. It's very important because this next set of information is going to be very important to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Here's why all of this is occurring. It's on the screen now. Okay, he lied to me. All right, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. He repented in church. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let's read. This is why God gave you apostles. This is why he's perfecting you, restoring you, and making you, having you to serve in the right way. Why? Read. Did you see that? That we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. I want you to underline this word, cunning. Underline that word, please. Cunning. Very important word. Cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to what? You know, when someone lies in wait, it's called an ambush. You can't, now listen, they lie in wait among the sheep. They don't hide outside the sheep. They get among the sheep and they wait until the right time. Now, I want to prepare. This is what I did for our church. You need to be prepared when, when cunning men come in among you because you're evidently going to grow. Your church is a church that's known over in Leesburg. People know about you. They know about your pastor. They believe in what you're doing here. And so you're evidently going to grow. And so this message is for you now so you can prepare so you don't have to worry about when this happens. But it happens in every church. How many believe that cunning men enter into every church? Okay, the question becomes how do you identify them so that you're not taken away from the vision the pastor has given you? Let me, let me show you how. Watch this. The, uh, when you underline the word cunning, cunning in the Bible does not imply men who are blatantly tearing down people apart or openly destroying fellowships. They're not blatantly tearing the church apart. They're not openly tearing down fellowships, but they are men who are well spoken and whose words carry a double meaning. Well, I, you know, I, I love, I, I love, I love, I love the lights. Yeah, I just love that. But uh, it's probably pulling a whole lot of electricity. I wonder how much that's gonna come out of my offering. What just happened? See, that's cunning. What did I just say? I don't like the lights. Come on now. Well, pastor, I don't, you know, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I think we should do it uh, this way. <laughs> Did I say something funny? What, what is that? that? That's not coming out and say, pastor, I don't stand for you. I don't believe in you. I want to do it my way. You say, no, pastor, I think it's better if we don't do it your way. I think if we went over here, it would be nicer. Look at your neighbor and say, God forbid. Come on now, say it nice and loud. God forbid. See, God doesn't deal with that slick stuff. God, God pretty smart. Somebody say amen. amen. But see, that's what a cunning man does. He doesn't come with harsh words. He comes with nice words, soft words, convincing words. Let me show you the first time they were ever used and see if I'm telling the truth. I want you to go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 1. And I'm going to show you some insight on cunning men. Because as a church that's grown, you need to understand this, because otherwise they're going to tear you apart. Every good church experiences this. Every good one. It's not uncommon. So let me give you the, the balance of the word, if I could. Gen Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and let me read it to you. Now, now let's read out loud. Go. 
Stop. The serpent was what? He was more subtle. The Hebrew word for subtle means cunning. He was smooth. Smooth. <laughs> Steve Yates original. Anyway, let's read. Then any read. Watch this. He will make you question what you have never questioned before. Do you see that? Did, did God really say? You, you, you don't have to eat of Really? Really? He'll make you question what you once never questioned. The tricks don't change. Watch this. Church, I want you to be aware of this. When a man or woman feels it's important to draw themselves out from the others to be seen or heard, it's called discord. Discord comes from a root word meaning chord. Chord is when three or more notes combine to create harmony. Discord occurs when one in harmony begins to seek his own. Let me give you an example. Anybody ever seen the uh, Lord of the Rings? Anybody ever watched that movie, Lord of the Rings? Y'all should be reading your Bibles. Amen. All y'all, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. I watched it. It's pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> but before the Lord of the Rings was ever written, there was a book called The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. J.R.R. Tolkien was a Christian author, and uh, he wrote the book, and it almost mimicked Genesis, if you've ever read it. It's a big, thick book. And in book Silmarillion, it tells the story of how the world was created. And he tells how God decided that he was going to get all the angels together and have them sing. And so they all got together and began to sing in harmony. Everybody say harmony. And as they began to sing in harmony, there was one, as we know now, Satan, one that was singing in harmony and decided, I want to be heard above all the others. So he raised his voice so that he stood out from all the other ones. Now, what do you think would happen? In the story, the other angels that love harmony, love peace and unity so much, didn't recognize it as disharmony, but thought, well, the way we fix this, we now will harmonize with the one out of harmony so we can get back into harmony. And they ended up being in discord. Why? Because that's not the chord God told them to sing. And so they all fail with the one who tried to be heard above the others. There is a danger with being afraid to follow the first order from your leader. If, you're, if, 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 that, if there's someone rising above to be heard, but you're not willing to go to the God of the universe or to the leader of the church and say, here's what I think, and not willing to do that, but they love to just cause discord among the brethren, that's a person that's walking in what? Discord. Disharmony. Here's the point. Dangers of continuing. I want to show you something in the word. There are dangers of continuing that conversation. Because you will probably find yourself trying to explain something that doesn't need to be explained. When God said it, that should be enough. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. Look what happened with the cunning servant. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. Thumbs up. I love it. That's it. Let's all read. Go. Read the next verse. First step, make you question what you've been told. Second step, make you defend what you know. God, but, 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 but God said, but, 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 but God said. Now the serpent knew what God said when he started the conversation. But he makes you repeat it to see if you know what you're talking about. A person of discord will always enter a conversation knowing the answer. Listen to me, church. 
then they will make you have to defend why you are here. Well, what, you know, I, you know, I understand what he said, but does it really matter if you do it that way? I mean, really? Do you really need to follow Pastor Moses? I mean, really, he's kind of, kind of loony, you know, he's kind of crazy. Okay, watch this. I want to show you the word. Watch this. If you allow this communication to happen after a while, guess what's going to happen? He asks a question, find yourself defensive, and the next thing the enemy is going to do is outright defy what you've been told. Watch stage three. Look at this. Genesis chapter three, verse four. Read it. Hold on now. Did God say you would die if you ate it? Then how do we get to a point where she's starting to hear the enemy say, you're not going to die. Trust me. We all still feeling the effects of that one. Come on now. You got to preserve the unity of the church because a cunning serpent can come in here at any point, begin to whisper words that your leader didn't tell you, and the next thing you know, you're whispering and talking. Well, really, do we have to do this way? I mean, why are we in use? Well, look at this building. I don't like that screen. I don't like to sing. I don't like guitars. Now, everything in chaos. Watch this. Verse 5. Read. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be in This is the worst stage, because this is where you see fallout in church. The fourth stage of a cunning man is that he will make you question your leader's intentions. God knows that if you eat that day, he just you, he don't want you to have what he has, and it'll make you question the leader you once loved. It'll make you question the instructions you were once given and you trusted him with you. Why else would anyone, come on now, why else would anyone be in this church if you weren't willing to be pastored by the pastor of that church? That's foolishness if you're not, if you're here and you don't want to be here. Look at your name and say foolishness. No, no, you didn't say it like I mean. I say, say foolishness. If you don't like it, leave it. Frontier, y'all didn't hear nothing I just said. That's for them. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's very important you understand why, why in the world would the serpent, why would the serpent try to use Eve to get past Eve, to get to Adam, to get past Adam? What did the serpent want? Has anyone ever asked the question? Okay, let me ask you this question. The Bible says that God put Adam in the garden to dress it and keep it. Can anyone agree to that? Can I see your hands up if you agree to that word? Okay. What does the word keep mean? In the Hebrew, it means to guard. To guard. What was he guarding in the garden? The tree of life, right? From who? Who else was there? <laughs> he, he's not married, is he? I didn't think so. <laughs> he don't have a girlfriend either? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Joker said the woman. No, 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 no. <sighs> no. Those serpents were there. And out of all that came to Adam, or came to Eve, they had to bring the one that was identified as the most cunning of them all. They didn't want to go through the guardian. They wanted to go around the guardian. And the pastor's job is to guard and protect the church. But a cunning man will not want to go through, but around. I want to show you the word I want to show you something here. What will happen as an effect of listening to cunning people? Watch this, verse six. Read it when you get there. And, and let me say this. 
when you listen long enough, you start to see things differently. Read the next verse. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit thereof and believed. Did you see what just happened? She began, now because of the words, she began to look at the tree differently. What's that tree going to do for me? How can it help me? Watch this. And I love this next one. And she did what? She, let me read it again. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And this is amazing. What you once protected with your heart you now consume with your mouth. Her job was to protect it. Ladies and gentlemen, in church, our job is to protect the fellowship and to protect the unity and to keep the bond of peace. And once what she used to protect, she now began to put a mouth on it. That's called gossip. Everybody say gossip. It is the number one killer to most churches. Can somebody say amen? Look at your neighbor and say, no gossip. No, say it like you mean it. Say, no gossip. Look him in the eyes and say, no. <laughs> See, at our church, we have a no gossip policy. You can't do that. Here's, how do you know if you're gossiping? If you're not a part of the problem and you're not a part of the solution, you're gossiping. Did you hear what I just said? If you're not part of the problem and you're not part of the solution, then you're gossiping. Amen. Anybody find that helpful? I found that helpful for me. Amen? Because I talk about all y'all. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Watch this. Now, once she put a mouth on it and began to talk about it and eat the fruit that she was once supposed to protect, put it in church terms, once the thing you lived and died to protect, now you talk about, you just can't keep it to yourself. What did she do? And gave also to her husband, and he did eat. Once you bite the fruit, you always pass it on. That's why gossip can't enter into a fellowship. Because number one, you will destroy what God put you here to protect. And number two, you will feed it to people that don't need to eat it. Can I get an amen from somebody anywhere? I mean, in the right corner, you in the, in the chair. Can I get an amen from some, hallelujah. Can I, can I get an amen over in this corner, somebody? Can I, hear, can, I get, can I get the baby to give me a hallelujah right here? <laughs> we must fight for unity. Let me tell you the power of unity. We told you the problem of disunity, but we must talk about the power that comes when we once become unified. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and we're closing here. This is the last couple of verses we'll be using tonight. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to see this. Jesus was the shepherd of the disciples. He was the pastor of the apostles. That was his role and his assignment. I want you to read verse 1. Go. Stop. They were all in one accord. In what? One place. Now, here's the thing that you don't ever read into this. They didn't know that was the day. Nobody knew that would be the day that the power would come from heaven. They just found themselves being obedient to what they were told. Oh. God on mercy. If you could just be in the right place at the right time doing what you're supposed to do, the power will always come. <laughs> Listen to me. You can't, you can't guess it. Well, it's been a year and two days and 50 minutes and 30 seconds and the Lord ain't arrived yet. I got to move on. <laughs> Listen to me. Be in the right place 
at the right time with the right heart, you can't miss them. I love this next verse, verse two. Read it with me, please. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. I feel it. Say it again. And suddenly, listen, how many are ready for their suddenness to come in their life? How many are tired of the mundane, the sorrowful? But if I can just get a suddenly on a Sunday morning, or on Saturday night, my life can change forever you just need one word from the Lord I don't need a million dollars just give me one word from the Lord and it's done I may find myself at the Red Sea enemies at my back people's nipping at my heel I ain't got nothing in my hand but a stick but if I can just get a word from the Lord that Red Sea got a part for me listen to me you need your suddenly but your suddenly can never come if you ain't in the right place, at the right time, with the right heart, you got to fight off gossip, fight off rumors, fight off negativity, fight off anything that isn't edifying needs to be buried. Thank God Jesus rose from the dead. Y'all can eat on that one later. Watch this. Verse Two. Let's read again through the whole thing. And suddenly, sound. Uh huh. No, it felt some. Some. Don't you yell at me. Some. Y'all yelling at the preacher. What's wrong with y'all? Not one of you will go without if you're on one accord. You know, that's the problem in, in modern day church. What about me? What about mine? That's not church. You're part of the body of Christ. It's about him. And the day you catch that is the day that all of you will be filled with mighty tongues of fire that will change and revolutionize your life. You say you revolution church. Well, start one. Defy what the enemy says will not happen. Defy the gospel. Defy the rumors. Defy the lies of the enemy and become one people on one accord in the same place waiting on the same thing. Who? Jesus. If he can just show up. If God can just show up. What? Okay. How much would you give if he just showed up one time? Would you give your life if he came through those doors and say, I'll show up and give you anything? Would you be willing to wait in one accord on one place and with one heart? Would you do it? Then Bible says, that, listen, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things God has prepared for you. So wait, lay down by the green pastures. Don't get in the water, lay down. And let God feed you. One accord. Watch this. I'm closing here. Verse 3. Read. Each of them. Four. And they were all filled. Uh huh. Yes, because they were willing to wait in one accord, the Spirit can now use them as he sees fit. Some of you are looking for destinies, and, and I'll just say this because I feel this. Some of you are looking for your destiny to be out there. But if you were to put your power in here, the kind of church you see, the kind of thing you see on television, the kind of, kind of, kind of, the prestige and honor and, and power and music and I see music and musicians and I see television screens everywhere and I see kids playgrounds and I see I see land that expands and I and I, and I see people in droves and I and I see cars and parking lots I see them gathering for a revolution it starts with the people that are here now don't wait for later it happens now 
The revolution starts now. That's your word. Then start tomorrow. It doesn't start when a new worship leader comes. It doesn't start when a new usher shows up. It doesn't start when a new sound person. It starts now. <laughs> Revolution begins tonight. Tonight. Watch this as we end out. The word accord comes from two meanings in the Greek. The same and passion. You want to be in unity on one accord? You have to be passionate about the same thing and I promise you the power of God will fall would you stand to your feet I just feel led that if there's if you're here tonight and you feel like Lord I want to be used. I want to be refreshed. God, I've, 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 I've been that person in the garden, heard the words, and God, I want to empty out that fruit out of my mouth, and I want, to, I want to be on one accord with what you're doing here. I want every eye closed, every head bowed right now. If that's you tonight, and you say, Lord, I just want to be one with our church, I want you to slip your hands in the air so heaven can see. That's all I want. Heaven is watching now. Father, we worship you. I thank you right now. The anointing of the Holy Ghost, I claim, should fall upon every hand ever lifted. That these men and women who say, God, I'm all in to what you want and the way you want it. God, I give and rededicate my heart to the work of taking this city for Jesus, of winning the loss for Christ, of being used in the upper room right here in this house is the upper room. We are the people on accord. And I release my will that your will may be done. And I will follow our leader, our pastor, our, our, our prophet, our evangelist, our apostle you placed in our city. And we restore our relationship back to you through the gift that you gave us, our pastor. In Jesus' name. Amen.